Rolling the dice is the nothing personal word of the day for Tuesday, March 14th, 2023. Rolling the dice is the way Max Scherzer described yesterday what it would be if he pitched in the World Baseball Classic. I'd be rolling the dice with my arm. Just what Major League Baseball owners want to see. I want to bring it back to when the World Baseball Classic started because this is becoming an issue and a bigger issue every single day. We are seeing more and more players getting injured, whether they're a part of spring training, whether they're part of the World Baseball Classic, whether they join the World Baseball Classic. Spring training is meant to get your arm ready for a grind of a regular season, much more so for pitchers than for hitters. There's a progression, and it doesn't really matter what you do during the offseason. When you get to spring training, there is a strict protocol that's followed to get you ready for a season. Get you ready to pitch every five days. If you're in the bullpen, get you ready to go back to back. Take a day, take two days, go back to back again. Be the emergency, we're up or down 10 runs, give me four innings out of the pen. The rubber arm spot of the roster is what we would call that. We need our rubber arm. Who's going to be the rubber arm? The guy who comes in when your starter's out after a third of an inning or two thirds of an inning. So you spend spring training doing all this, figuring it all out. And every four years, though it's been six years since 2017, there is this World Baseball Classic where players feel as though they want to represent their country and they want to win the World Baseball Classic. Now, I don't think the USA players necessarily feel that way as much as players representing other countries, which is a whole nother story, which we can get into a tiny bit. What is the reason why other countries, Dominican, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Japan, Korea, I could go on, where they say, this is our Olympics. This is our gold medal. This is, this is it. We want to get the trophy where the USA team really didn't take it seriously until 17 and then they won it. And now they're trying to repeat in 2023, six years because of COVID delayed it from 21. Why is that? Is it because of soccer? That's what we always thought inside baseball, that the feeling of soccer in the other countries, the feeling of national pride in baseball in, in Korea and Japan, the feeling of soccer in other countries, the feeling of baseball in the Dominican, just the feeling of what the relationship is to a sport and then to national pride. Is it because professional players who have never been involved in the Olympics in baseball, so they don't view themselves as having had that opportunity growing up to represent their country? We could not come up with the exact reason. If you have it, let me know. At David P. Sampson, what is the reason why the United States seems to care less about these international competitions? Is it because we're the United States and we know we're better than every other country? That sort of level of patriotism doesn't seem appropriate. I don't think that's what it is. But it doesn't help when you've got players who are American, who could play for the USA team, don't play for the USA team, and then tell you what their reason is. I'd rather they just say, hey, I don't, my arm doesn't feel right, or I don't want to, or I'm with my family, or I don't want to leave my team. But that's not really the reason. So if you ask every player on Team USA, they would tell you that winning the World Series means more than winning the World Baseball Classic. If you ask every player on Japan who's also in the big leagues or every player on the Dominican who's also on the big leagues, yes, I mean that, Julio Rodriguez, Manny Machado, Nelson Cruz, every one of them. They will tell you that winning the World Baseball Classic is more important and more meaningful than winning the World Series. So that gives you the framework for understanding why there can be a competitive issue with the United States team. Add a layer on top of that of the pitching and the rules that pitchers have to follow, which is 65 pitches in the pool play, then you can go up to 80 pitches in the quarterfinals, and then up to 95 by the time you get to the finals. Bullpen arms can't go back to back. All the, you can't go more than 30 pitches in an inning if you're a bullpen arm, maybe one of the rules. 
all prescribed by Major League Baseball because that is what baseball executives and owners and presidents told MLB. Those are the only circumstances under which we will even allow our players to play in the WBC. So MLB had no choice but to institute these rules, allow these rules, but now we're seeing what results when these rules happen. What results is a lack of competitive integrity. And that is the dirty little secret that MLB will never tell you. They want you to know that the World Baseball Classic is the Olympics. The World Baseball Classic is the meaningful preseason tournament every four years where we are gonna get huge broadcast deals. We are gonna have a tremendous amount of revenue distributed to Major League Baseball owners in return for their cooperation in putting this tournament out. It will be a source of pride, not meaningful, and revenue meaningful to you. That was the pitch. Well, as it turns out, if you took a poll of 30 owners right now, you would not get the required 23 votes to start the World Baseball Classic. You would not get the required 23 votes to keep the World Baseball Classic going, which begs the question, why is the World Baseball Classic still going? And the answer is the owners have done a little trick. And the trick is we're not going to pull ourselves, pull ourselves together and take a new vote and cancel this thing. On the other hand, we are not going to wholeheartedly support it. And we are not going to publicly in any way do anything that will do anything other than give an indication that it's our team that matters and not the WBC. Fair enough. The commissioner, the broadcast partners, Fox, they're all okay with the hold your nose, put your head in the sand, and just pretend everything's going to be okay. But every year, Central Baseball, the commissioner's office, spends time talking to team owners of players who get hurt in the Classic, or spends time talking to owners talking about the benefits of the Classic, and it always falls on deaf ears, but they keep trying. And this is the manager of the U.S. team, a guy named Mark DeRosa, who we interviewed to be manager, who's going to be a big league manager one of these years. Really, really good. Really ready to manage. It's his first managing stint. He's managing the USA team. And he made a tiny little boo-boo already. He came out and gave a bunch of quotes to Ken Rosenthal, and he said a bunch of things elsewhere. Read, read Ken's story in The Athletic about Mark DeRosa's view of these pitch limits, his view of managing the bullpen, and why do you think he's saying that? He doesn't want to get judged for the results of Team USA. He is a manager in waiting. He wants to make sure that it's very clear, and I'm not going to call him an excuse guy because he's not. He's a, an amazing guy, actually, really good at what he does, but... For all prospective employers out there, keep in mind, my hands are tied. I can't make the decisions to run a bullpen the way I would normally run a bullpen. The way when I interview, I tell you I would run a bullpen because I'm not really running a bullpen, which means I'm not really running a game, which means it's not really a game. Think about the slippery slope of PR nightmare that Mark DeRosa's quotes were. It's bringing oxygen and noise to what we were all told, shh, keep it quiet. Don't bring attention to what the realities are of this exhibition. We need the entire world to think this is the World Cup. That is what was always told to us. This is the World Cup. We're going to build it to be the World Cup. Why not play it during the season? Well, here's the reason. This was presented to us in a meeting quite a few years ago, and here's how it went. The All-Star Game has a problem. The broadcasters are not paying us. Fox is not paying us a premium for the Midsummer Classic the way they used to. Ratings are down. Interest is down. And more importantly, player participation is down. Every year, you've got a bunch of players who don't want to go to the All-Star Game. They want a break because the 162-game season is such a grind that come the All-Star Game and All-Star break, they want to go home. They want to be with their families or they want to sleep or they want to go to Vegas. They want to do anything other than go to the all-star game and have more appearances commanded that they have to do, sign more autographs, play in a game, take more BP. Don't want to do it. 
So MLB and the union agreed to rules about the All-Star game, which is if you pitch the day before, the Sunday of the All-Star break, you don't have to pitch in the All-Star game. If the team doesn't want you to throw, the team can call the manager and the pitching coach and say, hey, my guy's not available. If you don't want your position player to play, you say, hey, introduce him, but he's not going to play. And then on top of that, you've got the players who then say they're not going to go. Then they've got to be replaced. And all of a sudden, instead of 30 guys on the All-Star team or 35 guys, you've got 50 All-Stars per league, all of whom are getting the bonuses, which pissed off the owners. So the All-Star game has been a bit of a problem for baseball, even though it is by far the best All-Star game of any of the four major sports. So what the commissioner's office did is they went to the owners and said, we've got an idea. Let's cancel the All-Star game every four years and let's do the World Baseball Classic during July. Now, that'll mean for some a two week break, but we will have exhibitions, we'll keep pitchers ready because the immediate point of the owners through the baseball people was, we can't shut our team down for two weeks. We're gonna have to do batting practice. We're gonna have to do another spring training. We're gonna have to find a way because in baseball, you don't just stop and then start. It's not like in basketball where you can take two weeks off and then go take the court after a few scrimmages. You have to make sure your arms are built up. You have to make sure your batting eye and the timing is not lost. All the things that spring training is used for. So there was an issue with the July tournament. However, the positive was our pitchers were, will already be game ready. They will already be stretched out. And the biggest fear that we have about pitching in the WBC in March, if you're watching these games, these are very high leverage situations, high stress situations. And these pitchers, look at Christian Javier last night for Dominican. Uh, it's like a World Series game. And it's only March. That's the problem. If you are, I was going to say Drayton McLean, that's weird. If you are Jim Crane watching Javier pitch, you are crossing your fingers and praying to God that there's no arm injury. In July, you wouldn't have that issue. But then there were enough owners to block it, which means there were eight or more owners who said, we don't like the July World Baseball Classic idea because we don't want to shut down the game for two weeks, number one. Number two, we don't want our pitchers using any of their mid-season pitches, their, the bullets they have, on a tournament. We'd rather have them ready for October. So just keep in mind that there is no solution when it comes to baseball because baseball owners are so worried. I would view it as this if I were you. I would look at it like the NFL. Do you think that NFL owners would want an actual NFL tournament, a World Cup type tournament where there's actual tackling, where there's actual opportunity for concussions or paralysis or sprained shoulders or broken kneecaps? I mean, even if Dan Campbell weren't coaching, but would you not think that the NFL owners would say, you know what, we're good. And that's not because they're a $19 billion business. It's not because they don't want more revenue. It's not because they don't like the idea of making more money. It's because they don't want their people to get hurt. Baseball owners are the same. So the World Baseball Classic has its issues, but this year has been exciting. I don't know if you were watching USA crushed Canada in a must-win game last night. And boy, did I feel for that Canada pitcher. That guy's like a single-A pitcher. He's 19 years old. 19 years old. Wait, side note, off the subject. If you're not watching the Padres spring training, you are missing a 16-year-old catching for the Padres. He's 16 years old getting into big league spring training games. He could be a 16-year-old in theory called up and playing in the big leagues in an actual game. His name is Ethan Salas. He's 16. That's a 10th grader who's catching in the big leagues. Anyway. That just blows my mind. So this Canadian guy is 19. His name is Mitch Bratt. And did you see what happened during the game? He did not even make it an inning. He was walking people, giving up hits. And this is facing, uh, I was going to say Roland Betts. Can we cut that out, please? That's not, Roland Betts is a great guy, but I do not want that in the show. So 4 eight, 69. This guy, Brad, is facing Mookie Betts. And then when you have a lineup where Trey Turner's batting seventh or eighth, you know you got a problem. Mike Trout second, Goldschmidt, Arenado. It's insanity. 
How do you expect a 19-year-old single-A guy to get through that lineup? You can't. If you are Team Canada, that is another issue that you have. You are putting single-A players in a position that can totally screw with their head. You can get the yips. You can ruin a career going through a lineup like Team USA or like the Dominican if you get your butt kicked. On the other hand, the argument is, but wait, if you get through the lineup, then something good can happen. And that makes me laugh. Everyone is talking about the excitement of Duque Hebert, that Nicaraguan pitcher. He made it through the Dominican lineup. He's only 21. He struck out three guys and it's lead story everywhere. Nicaraguan pitcher signs contract after striking out Juan Soto, Julio Rodriguez and Rafael Devers. Can I please explain to you how that works if you don't mind? So the World Baseball Classic is like any other spring training game or any other regular season game. There are seats behind the plate that are devoted to scouts. It's called the scouting section. There aren't as many people who go to games as much as because of analytics and because you're watching games on TV, but there's still an area of your ballpark where the scouts sit and they're looking at players and they're looking around. They go on the field before the game and they talk to players and managers and coaches and they're either advanced scouting, which means they're scouting a team that their team is going to play in the future, or they are scouting a team for trade purposes at the deadline or off season to identify possible uh, players to acquire. So they write reports saying, I would acquire this guy. I wouldn't acquire this guy. Here's what you don't do when you're scouting games in minor league or major league baseball. After a game, you don't say, hey, I'd like to sign you. But in the World Baseball Classic, you can do that because there are a lot of players who are not in the big leagues. So this Nicaraguan pitcher, 21 years old, strikes out three guys. There's a scout for the Detroit Tigers. He walks down after the game that was in Miami and he says, hey, I'm just curious, how you doing? My name is John Lovitz and I would like to see about having you become a Detroit Tiger. And the Nicaraguan player, of course, Hebert said, really, I'm in. And then they get to announce it. Let me just, I'm not throwing water on this. I am not being the Grinch, but let me just give you the other side so you can be informed. When you sign a player to a minor league deal, which is what this guy was signed to, he's gonna go to single A or double A, and that's nice. He's a depth, an organizational depth piece. He's never gonna be in the big leagues, but if you're major league baseball, You are loving this. Is it possible that baseball encourages teams to potentially sign unsigned players in order to get a bit of attention saying, hey, look what can happen in the WBC. This is like a game show. This is like a reality show. Come pitch well and strike out Juan Soto and you can be a professional baseball player in the United States of America. It's a huge story, which means it's worked. He's 5'9". He's fine. He's throwing 87, 89. He's got a good mix, a change up, a slider, fastball, good, good location. Yes, he struck out Soto. Yes, he struck out Rodriguez. Yes, he struck out Devers. Fantastic. I'm in. That doesn't mean he's going to be or should be a big leaguer. So, are there players in the WBC that are completely unknown to major league scouts? Are there players who can be discovered? 20 years ago, yes. This year, absolutely not. Was it preordained that the Tigers were gonna sign this guy? Probably not. But is a story like that important for PR? Most definitely. Wait to see when I tell you something's gonna happen. Here's what's gonna happen. Duke A. Hebert, the 21-year-old Nicaraguan who signed a minor league deal with the Tigers will never pitch in the big leagues. It's a great story though. I love it. But is it calculated? You're damn right it is. What else is going on during the, Puerto Rico threw a perfect game against Israel It's not really a perfect game because it didn't go all the way and you have to go nine innings for it to be a perfect game, even in international competition. But there was a pitcher who, his name is DeLeon for Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has a good lineup with Baez and Lindor, et cetera. 
but it's not a real perfect game. Puerto Rico needed the game. It was fun to watch. It was exciting. But from my standpoint, the World Baseball Classic is now getting interesting. Where the USA, they got their win. They've got to win again. Dominican, they have to win again when they play. You see Japan coming over. They have one more round in Tokyo, and then they'll come over for the semis and the finals. I'm interested. It got me. But I was always in favor of the World Baseball Classic. Always. And that's not changing. All right. Did you see Ronald Acuna playing in the WBC? That was a wait to see I got wrong. On January 31st, 2023. If you're new to nothing personally, you don't know what I'm doing. Well, that you wouldn't be the only one. But wait to sees I follow up on. There's a document that Coca has that has all of the wait to sees. And you can look at ones I get wrong, ones I get right, but I will revisit it. I said Ronald Acuna will not play in the WBC on January 31st of 2023. I thought that there was no way the Braves would allow it to happen and that Acuna would use the Braves as the ability not to play. But boy, was I wrong. He is playing. I mean, I don't get a lot of stuff right always. I mean, I do get some way to see right. On January 30th of 2023, do you remember what happened when the Bengals lost their uh, playoff game. And do you remember there was a linebacker named Jermaine Pratt and he was yelling. Do you remember that terrible um, penalty that was called, cost him the game and they were yelling. I think that was the play, Coca. And there, there was this linebacker who was yelling, saying, how could you do that? How could you do that? You stink. And I said, that'll be the end of his Bengals career. His name was Jermaine Pratt. I even did a wait to see on that. Nope. He just got a three-year, $21 million deal. So I guess it doesn't matter that you're not a good teammate, even though he apologized and said he's always been a good teammate. He got lost, caught up in the emotion of the game. Go look at the tape on that. It was a previous show, January 30th of 2023. Got that wrong. Also, corrections. At David P. Sampson, we're live. Although we're not live today. We're going to be live five days a week, one of these days soon. But three days a week, we're live. Today, we're live to tape, which means we don't edit. I don't have a script. I don't have a prompter. I get things wrong. I thought, do you remember who won the tournament last year? Many of you do, the NCAA tournament. It was Kansas, not North Carolina. What I meant was, and this is what I do during the day, just a little nugget for you all. I'll finish the show. Then Coke and I will talk for a few minutes. Then I will take off this costume and I will go watch a movie to review the following day. Then I start working on the next day's show and Coke and I will speak throughout the day about different topics, different things going on. Then we rinse and repeat, do it all over again. And I read a lot during the course of a day. And I read that the University of North Carolina, who we talked about yesterday, did not make the NCAA tournament. And I thought they were the first defending champion not to make next year's tournament. So I told you that. It turns out they're the first preseason number one ranked team not to make the NCAA tournament since the tournament got expanded in 1985. So thank you for everyone who sends the corrections. My question for you is, do you all love when you get to send me corrections of all the mistakes I make? I feel like you do. I don't know why you do. It's normal, we all make mistakes. When we come back, we're gonna review The Last of Us the finale was during the Oscars. And one of the great Jimmy Kimmel lines was when he introduced Pedro Pascal, who was giving away an Oscar. He was a presenter. Jimmy Kimmel said, now coming to the stage is the person that the majority of the country is watching right now instead of us. Now the ratings went up for the Academy Awards. I think they had an uptick to about 18 million viewers and about 8 million people watched the final episode of The Last of Us on HBO. And a huge, huge success based on the PlayStation video game. We come back, we're gonna review it, and then we're gonna talk about Trevor Bauer and Jose Quintana. Do they have anything in common? No, but they both need to be discussed today. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal, it's David Sampson. We are here. Please rate, review, subscribe, tell your friends about us, keep spreading the word, we gotta grow. We gotta grow our audio downloads. I'll explain why one of these days, but we need more downloads. Coca and David need the downloads. Go to YouTube and subscribe, need that too. All right, The Last of Us. When it first came out, I wasn't gonna watch it because it was about zombies. Zombies scare me, but I love warm bodies. 
Strange, right? Could it have to do with Teresa Palmer? Nicholas Holt? Probably yes. Two, I don't play video games. The Last of Us is a video game, I heard. So I have zero interest in watching. Then, because I'm a victim of my own circumstance, where I do a show every day, and I've got to pretend that I'm not 55. So when things are being talked about, I say, ooh, I better start to engage with this topic. So I decided to watch an episode of The Last of Us when I was told that episode three of The Last of Us was with Nick Offerman, was Emmy Award winning, and you have to watch it, but you can't watch it alone. So I started watching The Last of Us, and I was H-O-O-K-E triple D, hooked. Pedro Pascal and Bella Ramsey play a father and non-daughter who are trying to figure out why there was a pandemic that basically ruined the world and trying to find a way if they can cure people because if they get infected, they become zombies and then kill people. And there's an entire weird way that the world is. It is totally dystopic, dystopian for age 69. It is a dystopian world, except maybe not anymore given that we just went through COVID. I don't know that I'm happy watching shows about a pandemic anymore, but this pandemic was way worse than COVID because the world basically shut down. Oh, wait a minute. This pandemic was way worse than COVID because millions of people died. Uh, okay, wait a minute. This pandemic was way worse than COVID because we never got back to the way we were, Barbara Streisand. So in this show, no one gets back to the way they were. Will they ever? They need a cure. Can Bella Ramsey provide the cure? Wait to see. How do you find a way to get Bella Ramsey safe? It is a journey. It's a buddy movie. It's a father-daughter movie. And the first season ended. And I got to tell you, I'm all in. I became completely enthralled. It's not scary. There aren't too many zombies. When they are, it's not one of those ridiculous things um, where, where it's like they come out of a shower. There's some interesting scares, but it follows the video game closely. But if you don't play the video game, then you don't know what's going on. But each show of the nine episodes present you with a different part of the story. So yes, episode three is a totally different story, not involving Pedro Pascal, but yes, involving Nick Offerman. But each show then starts with how these characters got into positions of where they are, what their backstory is, what their front story is, what their side story is. I was all in. Coca is the one who really got me to watch this. I thought going in, not knowing anything, that the first episode that I was looking at the stars of the show, spoiler alert, you're not. Don't get too attached to any characters. Second spoiler alert. Although if you play the video game, you know. Third spoiler alert. Can I give it? We promised we wouldn't spoil until a month. So we're not going to spoil it. So the review of The Last of Us season one is that you need to watch it. Nine episodes. It goes quickly. Okay. How do you think the Mets are feeling right now? Do, do I talk too much Mets here? Coke and I were having a discussion about this. Too much Yankees, too much Mets. There are a lot of Mets fans. I do it for you, Coca, because you're a Mets fan. When Jose Quintana was signed to a contract, he got two years, $26 million. It was in an effort to replace the arms who were lost, not just Jacob deGrom, but also further down with Ty Walker, Chris Bassett, other members of the Mets rotation who've moved on in free agency. What I am interested in is when you sign a two-year deal for $13 million a year, or you sign a two-year deal for $43 million a year, which they did with Verlander, or you sign a one-year deal for $10 million, little known secret, you sign it with the same expectation. And that is that your player who you signed will be able to pitch for you. The difference in term and notional amount of the contract is based on the market for that particular player. But the expectation is that every player you sign will be available for 30 plus starts. And the hope is that player will not get injured. The Mets obviously have gotten unlucky. They are spending money hand over fist, which makes the fans happy. They don't care. Owners can spend, spend, spend. Just keep spending. But all of a sudden, Quintana's got a little this. He's got a little that. 
and he may miss the first couple months of the season, a little stress fracture in his ribs. So this got rumored and talked about in the New York Post, which caused Billy Epler, the GM of the Mets, to actually go public and say, the New York Post story was premature. We don't know how long he's gonna be shut down. We are still talking to doctors. Horse hockey. They know exactly how long Quintana is gonna be out because it's a stress fracture of the ribs. Do you know what a stress fracture is? It's a fracture. When people say, oh, I just have a little stress fracture in my foot, I'm okay. Go on the x-ray. Oh, that looks a lot like a fracture. If you keep running on a stress fracture of your foot, it can split the whole damn thing wide open. It goes poof right through your skin. Now it doesn't really become a, dis a compound fracture, but I think you're getting my point. Broken ribs are a real problem when you're pitching. Do you think you use your ribs when you pitch? You're damn right you do. Will Quintana be out for three months? Yes. You think the New York Post made it up? Who would have that information other than Billy Epler? Hmm, let me think about that. Now, why would the Mets not want anyone to know how long Quintana is gonna be out? Because they don't want to be sniped. They wanna be able to go out and acquire a pitcher. They wanna be able to sign a pitcher. They wanna make a trade for a pitcher and they don't wanna overpay, overspend. Although they generally overspay and overpend, overspend and overpay. Four, eight, 69, because they generally overspend and overpay. But that is what many teams will do. Most teams, if they're smart, you do not ever release what the actual timetable is until you have to because you are trying to replace the injured player. Now, the Mets could say, we're not replacing him. We've got Tyler McGill, we've got David Peterson. We're fine, we were counting on that. You want a half a billion dollar team with Peterson and McGill at the end of your rotation? Are you kidding me? That is simply not happening. They're gonna go out and acquire someone. So here's how the meeting goes. Steve Cohn calls up Billy Epler and says, what do you think? Should we do it? We could do it, right? Do you think anyone will care? I mean, I don't care. This is what I do in my other businesses. It's totally normal. Do you think we can get Trevor Bauer? Do you think we should get Trevor Bauer? Wouldn't he bit be a fantastic addition to our team? Nope, not gonna happen. Trevor Bauer agreed to sign in Japan yesterday couple things, just to make sure that we're all very clear. Trevor Bauer's contract in Japan is because not one major league team would sign him. Not one. Number two, Trevor Bauer's contract in Japan has an out clause and it hasn't been announced, but I will bet dollars to donuts. I still owe a dozen donuts to the Levitard show. I just remembered that. I wonder if they'll ever have a chance to collect. I guess we'll wait to see. Dollars to Donuts, Trevor Bauer's contract with his team in Japan has an out if he signs with a major league team. That's number two. Number three, do you know that Trevor Bauer got suspended by Major League Baseball? Did you know he lost money because of his suspension? Do you know that Trevor Bauer is being paid by the Los Angeles Dodgers? Did you know that if Trevor Bauer signed with another major league team and his salary this year was $36 million and he signed with another major league team, he would still make $36 million, but 35.3 of it would be paid by the Dodgers and 700,000 or the league minimum would be paid by the team which signs him. One of the rules in baseball is that players are not allowed to double dip. If you are making guaranteed money and your team releases you and you sign with another major league team, you don't get paid twice. You get paid your original contract, but by two teams. However, if you get released by a major league baseball team and you become an electrician or a plumber or a pitcher in Japan, Whatever money you make doing those activities, 
you make in addition to what your contract says you make in Major League Baseball. So Trevor Bauer got released by the Dodgers. He just signed a $4 million deal with a Japanese team. He gets to make all $4 million of it, plus his entire contract with the Dodgers. It's additive. He's double dipping. It has the impact of his suspension being reduced by 20 games. Think about it, based on a salary of $32 million. He is getting $4 million extra dollars right now for going to Japan, and he wants you to believe that playing in the Japanese Professional Baseball League, the NPB, has always been his dream. He's never heard of the team that he signed for. He came out and said, playing in the NPB has always been a dream of mine. I can't think of a better organization to do it with. I can. It's laughable to me. I don't even understand why he would say it. Why not do a press conference and just say, I'm excited at the opportunity. I'm thankful for the opportunity to play the game that I love to play the game that I have missed. And I'm going to dedicate myself to changing the narrative around me and to making sure that people realize that I am getting better and got the help I need. How about that, Trevor? Nope. Puts his hat on sideways and says, it's been my dream. It's like a joke. So Trevor Bauer's gonna go to Japan. The Mets are still going to have to find someone else to pitch because they're not going to go with McGill and Peterson. Someone asked me yesterday, is that collusion that Bauer is not playing in the NBA? Someone asked me yesterday, is that collusion that Bauer is not playing in Major League Baseball? No. Collusion is when, and I've said it with Lamar Jackson, I'll say it about every single team, every single sport, here is what it is in layman terms. If there is an overt process that does something to quash either salary or the opportunity for a player to do a job or any employee to do the job that they are trained to do, and things are done in concert together, that's collusion. When individual teams make up their mind of what the market is for a player or make up their mind that they are not going to follow the lead of another team that has made a mistake or has tried to move the market, or they individually make up their minds that they do not want the bad PR associated with Trevor Bauer, that's not collusion. I told you that the closest I ever saw to collusion was the fact that MLB was not thrilled to have Barry Bonds back as a coach or a player. Guess what? We could have done it if we wanted. We could have signed him as a player, A-Rod as a player. We did sign Bonds as a coach. It's not that we're told you can't. We're discussed with the possibilities that exist when certain things happen. That's not collusion. What team? Steve Cohn does not want to introduce Trevor Bauer. Don't you realize he's pissed off enough of the other owners and the commissioner with all of the signings that he has made with the size of his payroll? He's going to risk doing it even worse for Trevor Bauer, a guy who hasn't pitched in two years? No, not going to happen. Trevor Bauer, welcome to Japan. You are not coming back. You know that. Nothing personal pick of the day. When are you going to start listening to me? We're on a heater. When we're on a heater, go my way. Warriors, four and a half over the Suns. That was a winner. The Warriors are great at home, not great on the road. Pay attention to whether they're at home or on the road. We are 35 and 35 after 70 picks. Let's talk about tonight's game. The Knicks have been on the road for, I think, a month and a half. They're playing in Portland. And I'm going for three in a row of home underdogs of a point and a half. Remember, we had the Grizzlies as home underdogs, and they covered a point and a half. Then we had another pick the day after. Point The Heat were a point and a half underdogs to the Cavs. Why my brain can remember that, Coca, and not other stuff is a little troubling. And then now we're taking the Blazers 
getting a point and a half from the Knicks on the road. I mean, that's just fantastic. The Blazers are, are at home getting one and a half. Do it, 35 and 35. All right, let's talk about John Morant before we were done here. This is important, very important. John Morant, it was announced yesterday or leaked yesterday or a story came out yesterday that he is in some sort of counseling, some sort of facility. Don't know if it's inpatient, outpatient, whatever the case is. He is seeking help. We don't know for what. We don't know if it's drugs. We don't know if it's addiction to strippers. We don't know if it's alcohol. We don't know if it's gun related. We don't know. What we do know is that when a player leaves during the course of a season, I hesitate to admit this, but I'm different now than I was for 18 years running a team. I would not encourage any of my good players to seek help for anything during a season that would cost them the ability to play games. Even if I knew about major issues, I would try to deal with it with the team psychologist, with therapy at the park, outside of the park. I would have done anything possible to keep that player playing. I look back on that decision and I realize that I did not have the best interests of the player in mind. I did not have the best interests of the player's mental state in mind or even physical state for that matter. I was interested in making sure the players were performing under the terms of their contract and giving us the best chance to win as many games as possible, which sounds crazy given the fact we didn't win a lot of games after we won the World Series. Well, we did for a couple of years, but the Memphis Grizzlies had no choice in this case. There's something going on with John Morant that is not my job to speculate. I'm not an investigative reporter. I'm not going to stake out all the places in Florida where he could be. I don't care. But what I can tell you is that for John Morant to leave his team and go get the help he needs during the season, there's got to be a major life-threatening situation. And that doesn't mean that he's potentially drugging himself to death or getting involved in shootouts or having suicidal thoughts. And if you are, please get help. That is not what I'm saying. Something acute is going on and it's not a player at a strip club. Players go to strip clubs all the time. Players have guns. Players do drugs. News alert, players do drugs. Executives do drugs. People do drugs. Something else is happening. I feel for Ja. This is a guy I got criticized on Twitter. I don't know why. He is on a Hall of Fame trajectory. This is one of the best players in the game. And he's a kid. What is he, Coca, 23 years old? If John Morant plays the, as well as he's playing now and then hits his prime, wins a title or two, he is a Hall of Fame player. Could his entire career be derailed by his current issues? Can't be drug use or brandishing a gun can't be proclivity to go to nightclubs or strip clubs. I don't want to speculate what it is. I don't care. I just want you to be informed that something really bad is happening with John Morant. For the Grizzlies to agree and for John Morant to agree that they had no other choice, not just first it was two games, then it was four games additionally. Now it's an undetermined amount of time he's going to be away from his team. The Grizzlies have to continue. Will this impact their ability to make it through the playoffs? Yes, you can win a couple games without him, but a four out of seven series, not going to happen. Their title chances are over if he doesn't come back. Or am I so cynical that they had him go away now because it was something so bad that he'll be back in a week and he'll say he's good. Guess what? Whatever the issue is, can't get cured in a week. And there's only 15 regular season games left. And then the playoffs start. If he really is in treatment for something and he chose treatment now because he had to get treatment now, he's done for the year. You can't treat something and say, all right, I'm good. I'm ready to get back into all of the distractions that caused me to have the issues I'm having now. You have to change your life. You think John Morant is going to retire from basketball? 
start living a brand new, different life? Something happened here and it's going to come out. Somebody's going to figure out where he is, why he's there, and what precipitated the need to do this. Don't even get me started on the pictures that came out of him at the strip club getting a lap dance. Absolutely ridiculous those pictures were released. Ridiculous those pictures were released. When you are the owner of the Grizzlies or the coach of the Grizzlies and you are put into a position where you have no choice but to allow your star player to take a leave of absence for the team, you meet your team and you say, let's hold down the fort. Let's try as hard as we can to maintain where we are and to go for that championship. But the coach doesn't mean it. The GM doesn't mean it. The owner doesn't mean it. And the players know it's not possible. It is so deflating and so upsetting. But for us, when we are watching a player disintegrate and we are trying to protect our investment, are we willing to sacrifice one year to protect to protect the long term of that player? Not always. But when you do, it's just business. For Ja and what he's going through, it's definitely personal. 